let your own ambition, because it's important to have ambition, to definitely be ambitious and figure out a way to exceed whatever amount of money you have. Like if you have $10,000 to make the movie look like it costs 100, figure out a way to do that. If you have 100,000, figure out a way to make it look like it was 2 million. Um, and, and so don't let the lack of money stop you. Like if you're, if you're making movies for less than a ghost story, you wanna to try to get to a ghost story level, like don't even think about it that way. Just make a movie that looks like, make a movie for as much as you have, um, as much money as you have, and set your sights higher. Like try to make it look more than a ghost story, you know? Just really um, find that perfect balance between like working within your means and having ambition that just is clear and present on the screen. And, and then folks will respond to it. At some, at some point, you're gonna get to a point where you're not having to pay for the movie yourself. And, and that's great, but until that you know, person comes around and it's gonna give you some money to do it, you've gotta just be ready to keep doing it yourself and keep you know, putting, putting whatever you've got on screen more than money. Like put money on screen, put everything else up there too, because ultimately, you know, if I were to, as Toby said, if, we didn't, if no one was you know, helping us make movies, which thankfully they are, we would just keep making movies like Same Thing and Ghost Story because we love doing it. And uh, and I would not really be spending too much time thinking about the budget. I would just be thinking about how can I make something better next time? How can I make something awesome? How can I keep growing as a filmmaker? So those are the important questions to ask um, while also trying to, as always, raise money. We're, we're, we're always doing that ourselves too. I would add, um, I mean, it's obvious, I guess, short films are a great place to start. <laughs> We, we made St. Nick and then made Pioneer and that everybody paid attention to Pioneer uh, and then that kind of got the ball rolling for the other movies. But I mean, even like Ari Aster made like a ton of short films. That's all he's ever done. His first movie was Hereditary and that wasn't a small budget. Hopefully that somewhat answered the question. Yeah. Uh, second row here. Did you guys all hear that? Okay, good. It's about the wife and the dissolve, and he complimented the music in the film. The, um, let's see, the wife is in that montage, and I was just, you know, I just wanted to put it really right I like the Star Wars, Star Wars wife. The dissolve, that's important. So people have mentioned that to me before, so you know, like, what was the intention of that? And it's the first, like, motif, and it kind of comes into that thing I was talking about all of our wonderful actresses earlier, is that at some point in the movie, each one has a line of dialogue, in a close up, and then we dissolve the next scene. And it was, I love dissolves. I love, you know, because they, they are old fashioned and, and they look really pretty, but when we did them in this movie, it was always with an intention so that you would notice them. And whether it was, you know, we are not, I mean, I wanted it to be noticed. Like, it's like, at that point, you are expecting to cut back to Casey. And I was like, the fact that we don't cut back to him, we linger on Tiga's face and dissolve in the next scene makes it stick out and makes you think about it a little bit more, even if it's on a subconscious level. So that was the intention there. And we do that again with Sissy, we do it with Elizabeth Moss, we do it with, with uh, Ari, who plays Casey's daughter. It was like one of those, those motifs to make those, those moments pop out a little bit more. I see guy in the white shirt straight there. Um, I enjoyed the look, I enjoyed that it felt sometimes like a film that was plucked right out of that time. I'm wondering if you could talk about like your process of planning on how to make that film achieve that look, achieve that. Well, we, we knew we wanted it to feel like it was made in that time period. And, and one of the things I've done in the past is, is get really carried away with sentiment, being sentimental and fetishistic towards the past. I'm a very nostalgic person and a very sentimental person, but with this film, I didn't want to fetishize that. And so we, rather than like shooting on 35 millimeter magic hour and making everything look absolutely gorgeous, 
we're like, let's shoot on Super 16, let's crop it 235 so that the movie has as little resolution as possible. Let's, you know, shoot it in the middle of the day in a in concrete, you know, on concrete overpasses with the sun coming down straight overhead. And and let's just try to like make the movie as it would have been made if we didn't have enough time or money in 1981. And and out of that, that aesthetic came. And there's obviously other things about it, like you know, zooms and 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 this dissolves for that matter. But really, it was about that ethos on set about making this in as old-fashioned of a way as we possibly could. At the same time, we were always like trying to have fun with the camera and do lots of you know things that made us smile. But we also were trying to just like find this weird mixture between simplicity and and being a little bit more rushed than we than we actually were, just trying to see like how few takes we could do. If the camera bumped on the dolly a little bit, we were okay with that. And some something about that added to that feel that made it, it seem, I think, hopefully more authentically of the, the year in which it is set. These are really great questions. Um, I see one up top there, pointing right at you. Yeah, you. Definitely, I you know the camera does pan away a couple times, and and every time it was something different, and I didn't ever necessarily know. Like for example, one of them was in the diner when Bob and Sissy are on their second date, and we had always talked about the two characters being teenagers. Like Bob's character, Forrest Tucker, is an arrested adolescent. You know, he he went to prison when he was 13 and never really advanced past that point in his life in, in terms of maturity. Um, and so, and then Sissy, you know, by virtue of being charmed by Bob, kind of like her inner 16 year old comes out a little bit in, in, at, at a few points. And so we wanted that scene to sort of reflect that. And our assistant director, Dutch, cast a lot of teenagers out on dates that night. Like every scene in the diner has a different, a different tone to it because all of the patrons, like in the first scene, it's just a bunch of guys there at their lunch hour. Later on in the movie, it's a bunch of people, you know, having like uh, couples having dinner. But right there, it's a bunch of teenagers, and there's a lot of energy, and it's very vivacious and, and fun. And so Bob and Sissy are, in fact, just two more teenagers on a first date, along amongst many others. I wasn't thinking about that when we were planning the shots, but we had this dolly shot that was designed to just follow Sissy in and kind of meander over to the booth where they're sitting and, and just end on the two of them. But as we were dollying, I just started noticing all of the background action and, and just felt like it would be kind of nice to just look at that. Like, let's just drift away and look at that. And, and sometimes you make those decisions on set and don't really think that much more than that. You're like, oh, that's, that looks pretty nice. Let's just move the camera and like, pan over and see all that. And in retrospect, there's significance to it because of, like I said, it's like we're leaving them behind to just let them be alone in that moment. Even though we got back to them a few shots later, it's still like, they're just another couple amongst other couples. And then it also subtly is establishing a geography, because that's where John Hunt's going to be later on when the third time you're seen. It didn't, that didn't cross my mind at all, but it does do a little bit of legwork for us. So there's things like that. And then other times, like, you're out at a pasture on a porch, and just, you're like, let's just, you know, how do you get into the scene? It's like, well, let's just pan in, pan out. And it just, it just feels right. You know, the rhythm of the scene kind of dictates that. And it's not, we're not trying to, like, showcase the landscape. It's just, it's just, you know, Sissy's saying, just keep on pushing. And she's saying that, and it's like, let's just push away. And it just, it gives you a nice out, and, and it feels nice. And the rhythm of the movie is very easy going. It's very, it's very, it just flows one scene to the next. And, and doing things like that sometimes get in the way of that in a nice way. It kind of like makes something pop. You're like, oh, I did, again, like I dissolve. It's a pop. It's something that uh, kind of jars you out of this gentle flow. And other times it just contributes to it. And very often you're not thinking about that consciously on set, but you spend so much time preparing and the movie's so ingrained in you that when you make those choices, they do wind up paying off later on. Uh, lady right up here with glasses. Hi, um, I Very much, it very much was. Um, 
that that one is the most overt, um, along with the caption at the beginning about this story also is mostly true. Like you put that right up against Bush Cassidy and Sonansky is saying this story is true mostly. This that's a follow up to that. Um, the the same moment was something um, that Casey he, he and his he, he and his kids love him like. His kids have grown up watching that movie. He said that they, that's what they do at home when they're up to no good. Like that's their, their secret code, and he wanted to he wanted to pay homage to that in the film. So yeah, he was looking through the whole movie for a spot in which it felt appropriate to do that, and that was the one. And um, I completely missed it because I was watching Bob, <laughs> but Bob said he was very moved by it. He wasn't expecting it. It was very touching to him. You've done a little bit of growing up too with with Casey as an actor. Why do you? continue working with each other. He was in Anthem Body Saints, and you put him in a sheet for all of the story. When you find someone who speaks your language, whether they're in front of the camera or behind it, you just, you like to keep working with them because it is a, it allows you to be more creative on set. You don't have to spend time convincing someone to trust you. They don't have to spend time like trying to explain the way they like to work. And so whenever I make any movie, I'm trying to bring as many uh, members of that family along with me. And so Toby and I have been working for years. I've done two movies with Bob now, three movies with Casey, two movies with Brittany. I just keep trying to just bring these folks back together because they're all, I mean, we, we have a really strict rule, like working with good people who we like to be around and people who make work not feel like work. And it's really wonderful to have that relationship develop and mature over time because you just get to know each other better, you grow together, and, and you just keep trying to make better movies together. And, and it really is one of the, you know, the best things about the filmmaking process is just getting to just reunite with these people who you, you really care for and getting to you know, spend time, a significant amount of time with them under an immense amount of pressure, but also just getting, it's, it, it makes making movies feel like hanging out. That's a great question. Um, it's always interesting to me when you edit a movie how you have a script, you go shoot it, you get to the edit, you watch the assembly, and you're like, well, that's not good. You tear the entire thing apart, reorder everything, keep shuffling it around, and by the time you get the final cut, it's pretty close to what you had originally written on the page. But you always go through that process. With this movie, I think it shifted more than any other, than any, any other film I made, and it was by design. Like when I wrote it, there was a degree of modularity to it intentionally. And and certain scenes I knew could play in different parts of the movie and have certain effect depending on where they played. And so to, to, to help that, I just had the characters wearing the same clothes pretty much through the entire movie. So that we could really, without breaking continuity, just shift scenes around, just move them around, see how they played. And so there were a couple significant discoveries in that and um, and a couple scenes that played in places I didn't expect. But by and large, it all did come back to the script. It's really funny. Like my um, editor Lisa, who worked with Peace, on Peace Dragon with us as well, like she said, she has never spent as much time trying things out in this movie as she has in her entire career. Like she's got so many amazing movies. She's like, this one is like, you you really pushed, you tried every possible permutation, and it's still just you know, and, and there was a lot of value in that. We did make a lot of discoveries, had a lot of fun ideas, but ultimately, it's sort of reassuring to you know that when you were writing a script. You spend a lot of time on it, and the choices you make in the screenplay are usually apparently pretty good because you ultimately go back to them. Um, but that being said, we did have a lot of fun discovering things, and, and the film uh, is full of things we would just, you know, we're just happy accidents we discovered in the edit, and uh, the pace and the rhythm and all of those things definitely come into play in the edit in a way that they never do in the script. And I love talking about editing, I can talk about this all the time. <laughs> but uh, but um, it really, I mean, there's so many things that uh, that also were so thoroughly scripted, like so many transitions that are still there, and that's always so satisfying to see that, to see that when you've been editing it in your head as you're writing it, that it'll actually come to fruition on screen. That's a great question. Right here. Hi, so uh, you're working with Casey Affleck, and you just said you uh, made the choice of keeping actors in the same wardrobe. Yeah. Um, 
I know this is based on a true story. Uh, I when I saw that, I was like, why is he still wearing the hat and the blue suit yeah. and the? Why would he get arrested hat? instantly? <laughs> yeah, and then when he got out of prison, he had a completely new, you know, super polyester, brand new suit, and there was a wardrobe change there. So I'm wondering. Um, since it is based in a true story, what did he actually keep that hat and and keep the same clothes? Because that seems like a giveaway. It does. It does seem like a dead giveaway. Um, I love. I mean, I admittedly love how goofy it is that they basically pull a Clark and Superman idea for their disguise. They just put fake mustaches on and that's it. They're like, no one's gonna catch us. I mean, that's part of the the the, the folklore, the mythology. Of or mythological side of the movie, I suppose, but also the real Forrest Tucker did like to dress in really fancy suits when he went on his crime sprees. I'm sure he took one. no. I'm sure he had plenty. <laughs> I'm sure he had plenty. I'm sure he took them off later on. But as we were like distilling this character down to a silhouette, basically, as we were turning him from a real person, warts and all, into more of an archetype, it felt appropriate to just distill his clothes down with it, down to that one image or that one outfit. And in the New Yorker article that the film's based on, the illustration was of a bank robber coming out of the bank in a blue suit with a brown hat. And I was just told, and then all our costume designers was like, let's just stick with that. And then at one point, I freaked out. I was like, I don't think we can get away with it. And she talked me out flush. She was like, no, this is a good idea. We should do it. And then for the end of the film, the, the 10 years later sequence where he gets out of prison, it was important for him to be wearing completely different clothes there because he's finding, like, he's fallen. You know, he's outside of his element. He's, he's not the same guy he was. And, uh, and it needed to feel like a, a big jump forward there. Yeah, and I think that toys a little bit with the idea that it, it wasn't just, you know, with the fake mustache and everything. It, it toys with the idea not only that he got his picks of robbing banks, but he wanted people to chase him. Like, he wanted... He wanted to be recognized. Like, he would have loved to have been able to use his real name and, you know have a signature that he could like sign off with and I think uh, I think he felt like more like a movie star than a bank robber and, and so as a result I, I think he probably would have been thrilled to have had this movie finally made. Um, I do know that he tried to send his life story to Clint Eastwood and Clint Eastwood never responded so hopefully hopefully he liked Robert Redford too. <laughs> Got time for one more up here. Uh, let's do this gentleman here. I mean, as Toby said earlier, we, we are sorely lacking in intention when it comes to our careers. <laughs> we definitely have intention when it comes to the movies themselves, and that intention usually comes down to, does this feel right to us? Is this a personal story that we feel like we could tell and that we could really invest a couple years in our lives in and feel good about it? And, and so that's always, I mean, it's sort of cliche to say that, that's always what we look for. Like, are these like stories that we really care about? I mean, that's why we write all our own material, because have to like know that it's something that comes from us. And so as different and as disparate as all the films seem, they're also, they feel very, I mean, for lack of a better word, autobiographical. There's an element of autobiography, autobiography to all of them because we just care about them so much. And we really, you know, they all do have a different feel, a different tone, a different, you know, texture, but they all still feel like our movies. And we don't know how to quantify that quite yet probably never will, but we won't make a movie unless we feel like we can make it feel like one of our movies, whatever that feeling might be. And, uh, and so there's never any choice. And we're like saying, let's go do a big movie now. Let's go do a small movie. I mean, they're all just movies to us, and we're lucky enough to get the chance to make them in all these different scales. But, you know, again, we don't make them any differently. And on, on that note, uh, what can we look forward to from you both next? I, you know, Forrest was all, always thinking about his next gig. What's yours? We've got um, several scripts that are long in the works, and I think we're going to probably make uh, one or two of them in the very near future. And um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to talk too much. I, I always get in trouble talking about them because then it's like, then people are like, like, so when are you going to make that one you talked about five years ago? It's like that one never got finished or and never cracked script. But there are, there's, there's, there's some stuff that's feeling pretty good. It feels, 
apropos what we just said, pretty personal. So I think we're going to have hope that we'll be back here in a year, year or so talking about this. Uh, producer Toby Holbrook, David Lowry, Old Man of the Gun. Thank you so much.